Well, thank you, first of all, this morning. That was, uh, that's, you guys are great. Uh, I just got so, I enjoyed that worship so much. I uh, appreciate uh, you all. Well, um, so my name is Sean. I'm with Youth for Christ. Um, start off, just to give you a little story. Um, the Velcro feeling started about 10 years ago. And by that, um, you know how Velcro, you know, it sticks, then you take a little bit of tension and there's that, and then it pops loose. Well, my sister lives up here in Clark County, over in the Hazeldale area. And about 10 years ago, every time my wife and I and my kids would come up here and visit them, as we would drive back across the bridge into Oregon, there was a Velcro feeling. There was this internal tension and then get about halfway across the bridge and pop. And after feeling that way for about two years, I finally looked over at my wife and I said, do you ever feel like maybe we're supposed to be up there? And she said, I have been feeling that way for about two years. <laughs> so we kind of, well, okay, there's something there. So we began to, to pray and to look and to, to seek out. I was doing church youth ministry uh, for, for years. That's what I studied to do in college uh, after fighting God tooth and nail over that and saying no. I finally agreed to the ministry part on the condition that it not be youth ministry. I said, okay, God, I will do whatever you want me to do as long as it's not youth ministry. And God said, good enough for now. And then first opportunity is, of course, what for a you know, young pastor? It's youth ministry. And then I've decided it's either a, an addiction or a mental illness, one of the two. But uh, I was doing, I've been doing youth ministry for, for that you know, whole time. Uh, but every time we try to find something up here, it was like either the circumstances or the Holy Spirit just said no. Not yet. Uh, during this time, while I was working in a church down in a little town called Cottage Grove, just south of Eugene, um, I met uh, the Youth for Christ director for that area. And he was a very sneaky man, as you'll see. He, uh, he invited me to, he's like, hey, you know, I'm going to be really busy this week. He's like, would you mind coming and just leading the games? for us at our weekly Campus Life Club. I thought, well, I can do that. You know, and I thought, well, that might be a good opportunity to maybe get to know some kids. And so I went and did it, and that week he, he said, hey, in about two weeks, he said, I'm going to have another busy one. Would you mind coming back and doing the wrap-up talk at the end for me? And I thought, well, yeah, I could do that. And over the course of these couple weeks, what I saw was a place where about 50 unchurched kids would show up and they'd play some games, have some snacks, and they would hear the gospel. And some of them would respond, but they were still outside of the church. And I remember thinking, I, I sat there, kind of stepped back during one of the points and observed from the outside, and I thought, this is fantastic. This is great. These kids who will never walk through the doors of my church are here, and they're hearing the gospel. What's the missing piece? And I felt like God kind of laid it on me. I said, well, you are. And so for the rest of my ministry down there in Cottage Grove, I was there every Monday night connecting with those kids. I was building those relationships, getting to know them. And what ended up happening was there was relationship there. They started kind of flowing back over to the church. They started to build those connections. I started bringing my volunteers and my students with me to visit this event. And we'd participate and and we were seeing kids not who were, you know, they were getting saved, and then they were finding the church. And I went and kind of hijacked the rest of the youth pastors in town and said, you guys got to get here. You guys don't understand what a gold mine this thing is. Well, over time, it just became evident that it was time for us to step away from the ministry, or ministry we were involved in. And we ultimately, what we decided to do was I went and got a job with Umqua Bank and volunteered almost full-time with Youth for Christ down there in Cottage Grove. Uh, just invested, my wife and I, just hours and hours of our time to connect with these kids. And about a year later, I came on staff in Eugene. Six months after that, I became a part of our national training team, uh, working especially with that area of connecting churches and Youth for Christ together. Um, and this last October, a uh, crazy thing happened. Because Clark County, let's go back to the beginning of the story, has never left my heart during all this time. It's always been there, just in the back of my head. Like just a little knock, knock, you know, are you still there? And, it's, and every now and then I'd still look, but I was like, no, Youth for Christ is where God's called us to be. We knew that for sure. But there was still this nag, and there was still that tension. 
And last October, almost a year ago, to this day, in two weeks, I'm, um, I'll be actually going back to the same place I was where this happened, our regional staff conference. Um, out of my mouth while sitting at dinner with one of our national gentlemen, I said, could you tell me, why is there no Youth for Christ ministry based in Clark County? Because no one's done it yet. I said, oh, okay, fair enough. Stepped back from the conversation, transitioned it, and went, okay, oh, that was, this just got heavy quick. I, I don't even know where the conversation came from. Uh, but I sent my wife a text that night and said, what would you think if I said? And my wife, being the uh, just incredible woman she is, said, well, when should I start packing? I said, well, it's, you know, we should probably slow down. And we, we went and spent about six months praying about it. And in February, uh, I called up the same guy that uh, I'd had that conversation with from the national office and said, when are you going to be in town again? I want to talk. And he was in town right then, said, let's grab coffee. So that day, him and I sat down, and I said, this is where I feel like my heart's calling me to do. And so we laid out a plan that would have us come up here and spend the next year or so developing relationships and putting the pieces together. So that way, by September 2015, we could move to Clark County and begin doing Youth for Christ in Clark County. We moved on Friday. Um, we now have a little place over on 8th Street right here in Camas. Um, I actually got moved into my office back in, back in, uh, my office back in August. Um, so we have an office here. Uh, I've been uh, up here almost three or four days a week and now my family um, and I live here permanently um, in Clark County about a year ahead of what we ever intended to happen. Um, and so I'm going to share with you a little bit this morning about what YFC is, what we do, how we do it. Um, but I want to start this morning uh, really by sharing the heart, the why. Um, the why does YFC do what it does? Why? Do, because I believe it really applies to all of us who call on the name of the Lord. All of us who place our faith in Jesus and have entered into a relationship with Him are called to the same thing, the same heart, um, that ultimately is the why that we do the things we do with Youth for Christ. And so if you have uh, your Bibles with you, we're going to open up to that same passage uh, that was just read from 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to go back just a little bit farther here uh, to start in verse 11. It says, It is because we know this solemn fear of the Lord that we work so hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we trying to pat ourselves on the back again? No. We are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart before God. If it seems we are crazy, there's a youth ministry hook right there, it is to bring God glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Whatever we do, it is because Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for everyone, we also believe that we have all died to the old life we used to live. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live to please themselves. Instead, they will live to please Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others by what the world thinks about them. Once I mistakenly thought of Christ that way, as though he were merely a human being, how differently I think about him now. What this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. All this newness of life is from God who brought us back to himself through what Christ did. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors, and God is using us to speak to you. We urge you as though Christ himself were here pleading with you, be reconciled to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. It's a little bit of a long passage, but it's important that we take in that whole piece there because there are three stories being told. Um, if you come back at the end and grab one of our brochures or my business card, you'll actually see um, the logo for Youth for Christ is a series of three, consent, three circles overlapping, almost like a Venn diagram. Um, because we see three stories being told in the scripture. Uh, one, and Paul leads off with this, is God's story. God's story is the preeminent cause of everything and ultimately the purpose 
of everything. It is God's story. I imagine uh, if we sat down in this room in a circle, and I began by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then just went to the next person, we in this room could probably tell God's story. Every now and then we'd probably double back, oh no, no, Isaiah came before, you know, and we'd, but we get there, we get through the whole story, we get that big picture, that story that never gets old, the story that's the reason we gather together every Sunday, the story we tell our kids, the story that God made you, God loved you, we chose to separate ourselves from God, but that God in His grace, in His mercy, loved us enough that He sent His own Son on the cross to die for us. That's God's story. And ultimately, when we enter into that relationship with Jesus, He has now taken our sin. He became sin who knew no sin. So we see at the beginning here, He says, you know, it is because we know the solemn fear of the Lord that we work so hard to persuade others. And again, we see God's story when He says, He died for everyone so that those who receive His new life. We get even down to the bottom um, you know, they, he became sin who knew no sin, uh, as we said before. So we see God's story woven through this. And it's ultimately the reason, even, I, I love the contrast here where on the one, he says, because we know the solemn fear of the Lord. And then you come down a little bit farther and he says, whatever we do, it is because Christ's love controls us or constrains us or compels us. There's I love all the different translations of that one verse because it's so rich in meaning here. But we get this combination. He starts off by saying, well, because of the reverent fear we have in God, we do these things. And then he says, but it's Christ's love that compels us. And it's, it's this perfect balance. It's this idea that we recognize God's story for what it is. We recognize that it is the biggest, most impactful thing. And that if you have embraced God's story... It should be the thing that drives you. I love that video that showed at the beginning. If, that's, if this story is true, it should be the dominant focus of our lives. It should have no other, I mean, there should be no other place that we look. When it comes to, okay, what should be important to me in this life? What, what glory should I pursue? When we are looking for anything other than the glory that God would give us, it should be like we you know, have a gourmet meal on one side and some bugs from Survivor on the other side. Like, Let me think here. I haven't had grasshopper in a long time, but I think I'll go with the steak. You know, I mean, it doesn't even make sense for us to consider another life. That's what God's called us to, but it's a life that, again, as that video said, I like the word messy that popped up in there. But God's story becomes the preeminent story. The second story in that circle is our story. And Paul alludes to that here in the same passage. He said, he said to, are we trying to pat ourselves on the back again? No, we're giving you a reason to be proud of us so that you can answer those who brag. Um, he said, if we're, in our, if we're crazy, it's for the glory of God. If we're in our right mind, it's for your benefit. He talks about our, the newness of life, that if we've embraced, if we've become a Christian, all who are in Christ, we're a new creation. We're a new person. The old has gone. The new has come. There is a transformation that happens. And that's why when you look at those, uh, those circles, they overlap. And when we talk about this, when we're in um, our you know, trainings and things like that with Youth for Christ, when I'm sitting down with a group of leaders and explaining this idea of three story to them, I will point to that overlapping portion between God's story and our story and call that, we, we talk about abiding. We talk about that being in Christ. Our story and His story become so overlapped that you can't tell your story without telling God's story. I, can't, I cannot tell you, I mean, just to tell you the, this quick story I shared with you about how we ended up here in the first place, how many times did you see God at work in that story? I hope a lot. Now, if I was to tell my entire life story, there'd be moments that didn't look so pretty. There'd be moments that weren't as overlapping, but the parts of my life that have been the most vibrant, dynamic, and true, where I've been the most alive and the most human, have been those times where my story and God's story have been overlapped, when I've been abiding in Christ the way he's called us to. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, saying, when you are a follower of Jesus, there's this new thing. You are now overlapped. Your story and God's story are one story overlapping. Says, but it doesn't stop there. There's a third story referenced here. I'm going to touch on the highlights of this third story. That is because we know the solemn fear of the Lord that we work so hard to persuade others. If we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. 
So we have stopped evaluating others by what the world thinks about them, or um, as the ESV says, according to the flesh. Uh, we've stopped seeing them that way. He says, you know, that's the way we saw Jesus. We don't see him that way anymore. We don't see you that way anymore either. We don't see other people that way anymore. We are Christ's ambassadors, or we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And God is using us to speak to you. We urge you, as though Christ himself were pleading with you, be reconciled to God. And we see in this one verse, it's... It's funny, and all the times, I, whenever I'm preaching, I always like to take you know, a passage like that, and I like to go, okay, well, verses 1 through 3 cover this, then verses 4 through 6 cover this, and then, and you can do it, it's all neat and tidy, but I love this verse because it's so mixed up. I can't talk about three story just in a nice orderly fashion. Well, here God talks about his story, and then he talks about our story, and then, because they're not meant to be separated. When we look here, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21, we see three story. We see this picture. We see God's story. We see us abiding in God's story. But then we see that if that's happening, if our story is really abiding in God's story, it can't help but get messy and involved in the stories of other people. And that's where we talk about that, where our story and other people's story overlap. We use the words disclose and discover. We talk about sharing our story and discovering their story, being willing to ask questions more than just, how are you doing? Being willing to you know, find out more about what's actually going on inside of a person. How did you get here? I met a guy fishing over on the Washougal the other day. Couple, would you just ask a couple little questions? You'd be surprised how fast people are willing. And I, I mean, all it started with was, have you caught anything yet today? Nope. Well, what was the last thing you caught? Oh, well, of course, in a fisherman, you know, it started here and then it got... Right there, it just kept getting bigger as the story went on. Eventually, it was a shark. But, uh, <laughs> but I began to find out more about his story. And I see you know, he comes down and, and fishes there. Our house is right down there near the Washougal. And so I've seen this guy a few times since then. And I've had these opportunities, but it's only because I was willing to engage in somebody else's story. And then ultimately, if our story and their story are overlapping, and our story and God's story are overlapping, what's the natural outflow of that? Their story and God's story are going to overlap. You have those opportunities where because you've engaged in an intentional Christ-sharing relationship with someone, that you're able to, when they share, oh man, I'm really having this struggle at work. Or, man, my wife is just driving me crazy. That never happens in my house. I'm just going to make that clear. If you ever meet my wife, I've never had a moment where she has driven me crazy. It's, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I just realized this was on video, so I better be honest, because she's going to want to see it. <laughs> but where you have those moments where you can say, can I share with you how God has made a difference in my life when it comes to my relationship with my wife? And I think she would agree with that, that that's... That has happened and has been true. That my relationship with God has made an impact there. And so I can share that. Hey, there's a Bible verse that's made a difference. You know, I've got a good friend who, you know, he's you know, a pastor at a church, and he's really an expert in this area. Could I introduce you to him? Maybe we could grab coffee together. There's those opportunities that begin to come out and to where you begin to see that three-story model, and that is at the heart of Youth for Christ. And we don't just talk about it when it comes to evangelism. Um, we, talk, we talk about that. That's just the way we live our lives. Evangelism is just the outpouring of living a missional life, a life according to this three-story thing, just out in the real world. Because if I'm living this way with my wife, if I'm intentionally, continually trying to learn more about her, understand her story, the same time I'm abiding with Christ, I'm developing more, my relationship with Him tighter, then that's naturally going to have an outpouring to where the gospel is going to be revealed to her more deeply because of my interactions with her, and vice versa. And the same thing with my kids and my friends and those in my church. And that's naturally going to outflow. It's not like I just don't put a wall up that when I go step out into the real world with, the, with unbelievers. That's going to naturally outflow and continue on. So rather, it's not an evangelism method. It's not a program. It's not a how we do things. It's just this is a who we are. And so I believe this is really the call on all Christians and it's one of the reasons I love being a part of Youth for Christ is that we've taken this basic call that's a part of the life of the, of the church large, and we've said this is our foundation for who we are. 
And I'm going to talk a little bit here about uh, what we do, how we do it. I'm actually going to show a quick video that relates to one of our programs uh, here. Let's step out of the way and let you play that. Students, they are our future. Students, they are our future, but less and less of them are followers of Christ. This generation of youth are the least churched we have ever seen, and almost 30% of them identify as atheists. In the United States, there are over 69,000 middle school and high schools. In those schools are over 24 million students between the ages of 11 and 17. Of those students, at least 15 million do not regularly attend church. Campus Life, a ministry of Youth for Christ, has reached out to these kids for over 45 years. There is Campus Life ministry spanning the country from San Diego, California to Long Island, New York, and everywhere in between. With over a thousand ministry sites, we engage over a hundred thousand students each week, and that number is growing daily. The question remains, with so many lost students, how can we possibly reach them all? How does Youth for Christ reach this skeptical generation that is unaware of their need for a savior? We don't wait for students to come to us. We intentionally go into their world in order to initiate new relationships, whether it be on campus, hanging out at the skate park, or rooting for their team on a Friday night. We go where students are. As these relationships form, students enter into the community of campus life. One natural way that happens is through club. Club is a weekly high-energy gathering where community is built and God's story is told. We also create opportunities for students to engage in deeper relationships with campus life leaders through shared experiences. We spend time with students to earn the right to be heard, model Christ-like behavior, and be a listening ear. As relationships grow, we connect with students and give them individual attention to ask questions, share doubts, and navigate life. We also provide opportunities for students to gather in small groups where we discuss relevant issues that they face and their spiritual needs. As we do this, we help them connect their story to God's story. Trips are an opportunity to bring students out of their environment. Through unforgettable activities, Christ-sharing relationships, and a clear presentation of the gospel, we see God change lives forever. Throughout this journey, we work together with the local church to help raise up lifelong followers of Jesus. But that is just the beginning. We engage Christian students who are committed to personal growth and influencing the people around them for Christ. These students then join us in the mission of sharing God's story with their friends and raising up lifelong followers of Jesus. Many of them even return to Youth for Christ as volunteer or staff leaders. So, with so many lost students, how do we reach them all? By empowering a relational army of student and adult leaders to engage students in authentic, Christ-sharing relationships, one student at a time. of adult and student leaders who will build an authentic, intentional, Christ-sharing relationships with the lost. Um, as we come up here, one of the things I love about Youth for Christ is we have a huge variety of programs. We have about six national ministries that run, y'all are all run out of our national office uh, that focus in different areas. Um, there are two that we're keying in on early on that we're Kind of, we're at the, it's, I love that we're in the, still in the spot where we're very flexible. Uh, one is campus life. Um, this is going to take time to build. Uh, believe it or not, you can't just walk onto a high school campus um, and start introducing yourself to kids. Apparently, they frown on that. It takes time to build relationships, to develop the contacts, and to develop the trust. Um, we've, uh, we have a long history of being the kind of ministry where schools desire us to be there. Uh, but that takes time to build that. Um, we never force our way onto campus. It will take time for us to develop those relationships in Clark County, especially the, the climate, um, really in the world at, at large, but here in Clark County as well. And I'll, I'll, those numbers up there, um, you know, 30% identify as atheist. And when I looked at the numbers for Clark County, it is much, much darker than that. Um, I think those numbers must have been taken out of Kansas. Um, because at least here, at the absolute best, if you take the census data and you look and you, and you just kind of go, okay, break it down, how many adults identify as evangelical Christians? And it's about 30% maybe 
Um, when you talk about ones that actually attend church on a regular basis out of the census, that shrinks a little bit more. And then if you just make the assumption that out of all of those adults, they all have kids and that all of those kids are a part of, that have followed in the faith of their parents because their parents don't just go to church, but actually live it out in front of them. The number at best out of the 45,000 middle and high school students in Clark County is maybe 10,000 kids that actually have a relationship with Jesus. As far as I can see, um, practically, and I believe it's probably more like 1 in 10 um, are actually living in that, that life. And so there is a real need, but it's, it's like that said, an army of adult and student. And campus life is a program. It'll probably take us about two years to actually make that move. But the best news for me is because of another program we have, we don't have to wait till then to start making an impact. Um, we have a program we call YFC Core. Uh, Youth for Christ core that works specifically with Christian students and it alluded to that a little bit in the video where we take Christian students and we teach them what I just shared with you three story we do it more than just in a in a words but in in action we do it together in a group a group of Christian students from a variety of churches who come together get to know each other learn how to live that three story world together and then we challenge them, equip them, and hold them accountable to then taking that out and doing that with their non-Christian friends in their schools. And then as they come back to their youth groups and back to the YFC core meetings, they're challenged on, hey, you, so you were, you were going to introduce yourself to that kid Jim this week. How did that go? Hey, you were going to invite Susie to come to church with you on Sunday. Did you, did you follow through and do that? And so there's some accountability there. They were praying for each other. We're seeking God together as a group of students with some adult leaders on how students, because they don't, students don't need permission to walk onto campus. In fact, they need permission to stay off campus. So where I would, it would take me two or three years to develop a relationship to be able to walk onto campus high school anytime I want to. Down in Eugene, uh, Youth for Christ has been going since 1947. Um, at the school where I served, they've had a continuous campus life presence there since about 1968. And so, I, and I went to that high school, the high school where I was serving in Eugene, and the bookkeeper was my Sunday school teacher when I was five, and so I could walk onto that campus anytime I wanted to, I could pass out flyers, I could talk to kids, I could throw frisbee around with kids, I could engage in just about anything, and in fact they learned to rely on me. I don't have that relationship in campus. I don't have volunteers who can do that in the Evergreen School District. I don't have the people who can do that in the Vancouver School District or La Center or Battleground. But I am getting to know Christian students and we're developing those teams right now. We're starting to pull churches together, pull youth groups together, and we're getting those kids excited about learning to live out the faith the way that I think we would hope that all of us as adults would do the same thing. But we're equipping our kids to do it now. So that way they learn that this is what being a part of the church means. It means living this life where God's story and our story are intricately connected. We, we are not going to have to, where we have a generation of kids who grow into adults who don't have to be persuaded that things might get messy because they know it because they've been doing it since they were 16. That's the heart of Youth for Christ, is that we're not just about adults going in and standing up and sharing the gospel in front of a large crowd. We're about building those intimate Christ-sharing relationships. So we have kind of our strategic plan involves using YFC Core as our beginning point for the next couple of years. And then as opportunities come up, as we get the volunteers and the staff brought on, that's when we'll start establishing some campus life clubs around the county. Um, it is exciting. It's been fun to watch. It's been fun to see how the church, and I say watch because that's a lot of what it's felt like. Um, none of what's happened so far is anything I can take credit for. Um, it is ultimately, God has been moving so far ahead of us and so far in advance that we're just going along for the ride at this point. And God has had churches coming to us. Uh, one of my favorite stories I love to tell, I just realized, involves this church. Because I didn't contact you. Daniel contacted our national office. Because he was looking for how can I better equip kids? How can I better connect to kids? And so he contacted our national office and said, what are you doing in Vancouver? And they said, nothing yet, but here's a phone number of a guy who's about to. And him and I got together, had some coffee, shared together, and that was my introduction to Parkside. Was because, and because God put it on his heart to reach out to YFC. Um, and that's one of about five stories like that. Where I didn't even know 
who to talk to. And God brought the right person along, who then introduced me to the right person, who introduced me to more people. And so God is doing something amazing in Clark County. I will tell you, it's not just happening here. As I talk to churches across the county, God is at work. God's story is being pressed forward. And it is an exci- I'm, I'm excited to just be a part of it. So let me wrap up just by sharing how you can help. Um, as we get started, the number one thing we need uh, desperately, um, like I said, God has been at work in all of this. God has been the driving force. Um, therefore, if I, if I can't take credit for it, I'm depending on him, it means we need people praying for us. Uh, because ultimately that's what's going to lead this to be the impactful ministry that's going to change uh, this county in the way that we hope it will. Um, that's going to bring um, a generation closer to Christ. We need people who are willing to regularly pray for us. Um, and uh, back in the back I actually have some brochures that have a place where you can put in your name and email address so you can get our email. But once a week I send out an email that just says this is how you can be praying, kind of give some um, specifics on, on what kind of where we're aiming where we're heading, what are some specific ways you can be praying for Youth for Christ in Clark County. That is far and away our number one need um, as we get started up here. Um, the second, we, uh, we, we do need financial support. And so we are on that same form. There's a place where you can indicate your willingness to support us monthly or with a one-time gift that will help us to ultimately bring on the staff, um, train the volunteers, uh, you know, do those times where we take a kid out to coffee or we're engaging with students. Um, there's a budget for that. Um, and, uh, and we do need financial support. So even if it's, you know, 10, 20, 50 dollars a month, everything like that makes a huge difference in what we're able to do as we connect with students, as we equip adults uh, to go forward um, in carrying the message of the gospel in Clark County. Um, and the number three thing is direct involvement is actually getting messy. Um, we need people who are willing to step in. We're just right now at the very, that very beginning point. The programs haven't started yet, but we're going to need people who are willing to get their feet in the mud a little bit. And to some degree that may involve people who can lead small groups for these YFC core groups that we have. Um, it may mean that we need some specialized things. That's, I'm always asking, I'll throw that, if you drive a bus, if you have a boat, if you, I mean, if there, if there are special things that you have, that you think, you know what, I bet God could use that in the world with teenagers. Those are the kind of things where I'm collect, kind of collecting that information. Um, just as an example, this next uh, week I'm traveling with uh, the Youth for Christ chapter down in Lane County, where I was, kind of as my parting uh, trip with them, we're going down to Six Flags, and we have eight bus drivers, we have about 20 volunteers, uh, no, more than that, 37, I think was the last count I heard. I've, it's weird, I'm not a part of it anymore, so normally I'm right in there with the numbers and all the nitty gritty, but this time I just get to go. It's kind of fun. Um, but we need, it takes a lot of adults, it takes a lot of people to engage in the lives of students. Um, and so if you're willing to be directly involved, that would be something to maybe, on one of those brochures, just maybe make a note in there. Yeah, I drive a bus. I have a minivan. I, you know, this, any way that maybe you can think right off the top of your head. Or, you know, I'd like to be directly involved. I, I, I feel like God's laying it on my heart to lead a small group. Um, let me know uh, about those things. Uh, ultimately, my hope this morning, though, is I hope that you take this three-story more to heart. Talking with Daryl, it sounds like this is kind of a pickup from some stuff that you guys have been talking about. That video fit in perfectly, so I'm guessing that's related to things you've been talking about. Is that ultimately it is. It's about connecting your story to God's story and then getting involved, being willing to get messy, being willing to get connected to the story that God's doing um, in your neighbor's lives, in your kids' lives, and then the lives around you. Um, any life that needs to be impacted by the gospel, which at last count was all of them. Um, that's my hope, um, above and beyond anything else, is that Three Story becomes not just, a, not just something you heard about Youth for Christ, but it becomes a part of your story. So let me go ahead and pray to close this. Father, I thank you that, uh, that I get to be a part of what you're doing in Clark County. God, God, you moved our hearts here long before you ever moved our address up here. Um, and so, Lord, we recognize that ultimately this is your story, this is your mission, this is your cause, and it's for your glory. 
And so, Lord, we just uh, I just thank you for uh, Parkside and for the opportunity to come share here this morning. And I just ask that uh, you would just remind us all um, to abide more and, Lord, to share our story more. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.